Hey everyone! Welcome back to my Procedural Ruins tutorial series for Cytopexus Project Grot. In the previous lesson, we learned how to create a procedurally painted damage setup where anything we painted with vertex colors will be fractured and removed. In this chapter, we'll go over adding details and edge damage and why you might have to be mindful of how you choose to apply certain features to your tools. Let's get into Udini! All right, so here's where we left off. I think you can already see a good resemblance of the final ruins, right? But we still have a little bit of a journey to get there. So what I wanna focus on in this chapter is how to get some interesting details and edge damage in there. And also I wanna unify this whole mesh in the process because you don't have to do this right now, uh, you can just watch. If I get the exploded view node, for instance, and I plug that in, you can see that this whole mesh is made up of a lot of different pieces and also they all have varying degrees of polygon density. So I wanna take care of that. I think maybe first I would like to start with my Voronoi chunks that are like very visibly low poly. And that's pretty easy. There is a node called RBD interior detail and we can just drop that after our blast node. You can see that it does something but it's, uh, it doesn't look very detailed just yet. And that is because the detail size is uh, still pretty high. We can dial this down, but be careful because it can very quickly explode your poly count. You know, dial in whatever you feel comfortable with. Uh, maybe something like this. Then to see more of this detail in action, we can play around with the noise amplitude and then we can see what it's actually trying to do. It's trying to add some noise to the insides of our fractures and the more detail we have, the more apparent it becomes. We can play around with the amplitude and the frequency to get the result that we want. I think this, this works pretty well um, as rock, but it still has too much of a, of a blocky look. The edges are still too sharp and too geometric, so I would like to break that up. And the cool thing is there is a node for that already called the uh, Labs Edge Damage node. So let's just plug that in. So we can immediately see that what the node has done is it voxelized the entire mesh resulting in a very even uh, polygon density and it has added this interesting edge damage all around it. The damage itself might look a bit low poly depending on the scale of your object, but we can address that by increasing the resolution right here, maybe to something like, I don't know, 0 0.9. And this will increase the resolution of the cutting geometry and should make it look a bit more organic. Yeah, right, this looks much more like rock or something. One thing I noticed though, uh, while I was making this video, is that the edge damage node can sometimes produce bad geometry. And the reason for that is probably, maybe there's a tiny hole in our low poly mesh, maybe there's some stuff overlapping. Because of the nature of our tool, where we paint wherever, whenever, it's pretty likely that we might produce some bad input geometry. One way that we could easily fix this is by simply voxelizing it once before we run the edge damage node. So um, we can get the lapse voxel mesh node and just first voxelize it once. Let's see, let's try to get the right kind of poly count for us. Maybe something, yeah, like 0 0.02 division size. And because we're only interested in the shape of our mesh, we can also add some adaptivity to save some uh, poly count during the calculation. So maybe add something like 0 0.1 adaptivity. And now we can run it again if we want to. Okay, so now we have our edge damage, but you might be thinking the same thing that I am. And that is, uh, okay, the edge damage looks cool, but now it's everywhere, right? Um, and that's not really how I would have imagined it. I would have imagined that probably it should be focused somewhere around where we paint it, because that's where the damage should be, right? And we can do that though, because the edge damage tool has also a mask attribute input. Uh, however, one thing to be aware of is that, you know, like with the scatter node earlier, the higher the mask attribute value was, the more points were scattered in that area. With the edge damage node, it works the opposite way, where the lower the value is, the more damage there is, and the higher the value, the, the less damage there is. We have to be aware of that and just invert it before we apply the mask attribute here. Also, we're missing it right now because of our remesh grid. I mean, we can try to transfer our surface attributes, but as you might see, there isn't really anything being transferred. And the reason for that is because 
earlier on when we were attribute promoting our mask attribute we turned it into a primitive attribute so now we have some conflicting information over what the mask attribute is is it a primitive attribute or a point attribute i think in those kinds of situations it might just be best to wipe the slate clean and i'm just gonna get an attribute delete node and wipe both of the mask attributes and what we can do now is we can get an attribute transfer node and we can just get the value one more time. So let's just go back. And same procedure as last time. Um, make sure to only select the attribute we want to transfer. And then I'm going to increase the sample count to make it a bit smoother. And then we want to invert it. So I'm going to get a wrangle and type at mask equals one minus at mask. Okay, so now let's see what happens. Okay, nice. And now we now we see that we only have the damage where our paint is. In case you want the damage to reach a little bit further, um, because you can see that it stops being deep blue around uh, around the border of our damage, maybe we wanted to extend a little bit. And um, I'm gonna show you a quick and easy way how to make our attribute grow. So um, what we could do, for instance, is we could get an attribute blur and I'm going to type in mask and um, we can blur it and that way kind of dilate it and make it make it grow outwards. And then we can combat the blurriness by getting an attribute adjust float node. So let's type in mask again and then we can say it should be a multiplication operation and then we can increase the constant value. And I want to show you something interesting. And you can see that now it's behaving in the opposite way that we want it to, right? Like it's it's shrinking actually now. And I wanted to point that out because in any kind of procedural software, be it uh, Houdini or Blender or Substance, the order of operations is crucial. So um, in this case, because we first inverted it, it makes it shrink. However, if I take my nodes and I plug them in before the invert, we can see it has the opposite effect. Now it grows the attribute. Sometimes the most effective way to fix a problem in your graph is simply to move your nodes around, up or down. So now we've effectively grown our mask attribute and let's have another look. And that looks pretty good. Yeah, I like this. And I think we don't really need much more for our detail, but however, with detail also comes a lot of polygons. We have so many polygons right now that we can't even really see them on our wireframe. And I want to talk about that for a moment. Because yes, we are making this tool for Unreal Engine 5 in mind, and we are going to use Nanite, but it doesn't mean that optimization is completely irrelevant. It gives us a lot of freedoms, but there are still some things that we should keep in mind. So I think the biggest one is RAM. Depending on your machine, a tool like this might make your computer run out of memory really fast. And because these operations that we're using here, such as VDBs and, and in general, like high poly counts, are really heavy on your RAM. Um, so this could add up to more than 64 gigabytes of RAM easily. And another reason that you should be aware of is file size. So it doesn't even matter how good your computer is. File size is file size, right? And it can be a problem when you're collaborating with other people or when you want to upload your files somewhere. And it can also be a problem, you know, for whoever is going to look at your scene or play your game. So a good rule of thumb that I've learned is that uh, around 2 million polygons will result in roughly 100 megabytes of file size. So how can we optimize this? There are many different ways. Um, the first one that we can look at is controlling the output of the edge damage node. So as you can see, the standard value that we have in here is the, um, a voxel size of 0.01. Of course, the larger the voxel size, um, the lower our detail is going to be. So if I type in 0 0.05, um, yeah, it's not going to look as nice anymore. So that would be a shame. So let's see, maybe we can do 0 0.25, 0 0.2. Even a very small change can have a large effect. Let's say maybe 
that we choose this. So we already saved uh, a large amount of polygons. And I'm sure you also noticed that the calculation speed is much faster. So that's another point that's important. The cook time of our tool will be much shorter if we have a more optimized tool. However, the most effective method to reduce poly count, um, which is also unfortunately the slowest, is to um, use a poly reduce node. I'm saying the slowest because unfortunately the poly reduce does take quite some time to calculate but it does an amazing job of maintaining our shape while removing unnecessary geometry. If we just use the standard settings and for instance, um, reduce it down to let's say 10%, we can see that it does an amazing job of keeping the shape exactly as it was. But I think that the difference between the high detail and low detail area is a bit jarring, um, especially considering that we want to use vertex colors later for our shader. The good thing is we can control this by using the equalize length parameter over here. Right now it has a really, really, really small number. So 0 0.00000 and so on one. If we reduce this to six zeros, it already has a huge effect and we can see that it tries to have a more equal distribution of polygons here. Maybe this is already enough for what we need. I think this is a good balance between maintaining the detail where it matters but still leaving uh, enough vertices so that we can make use of our shader later on. If you want to dig deeper into this, there are some interesting features in here. For instance, if we want to we can retain the density by another attribute. So if we wanted to, we could use our mask attribute to further retain the vertices. Um, let's have a look at where we are at right now. Yeah, 67,000, that's great. Um, but of course we have to be aware that depending on the scale of the block out in our Unreal scene, we might have a much higher poly count than we have right now. But I think this is pretty good. So this is basically our detail mode. So last thing that I want to mention before we end off this lesson is the user experience. Um, because this looks much better than what we had in the last chapter, but now it comes at the cost of time. So let's say we're the artist that's using our tool and we want to go back and uh, want to make changes to our ruins. So, you know, I'm going to start painting somewhere and I'm going to make a change. And you can immediately see uh, that it's not as nice and responsive anymore because it has to go through all these different steps of adding detail and removing polygons and voxelizing because we told it to, right? So how can we balance that out? How can we make sure that the artist has a nice and smooth tool while also having the ability to add final quality uh, mesh detail? What we can do to get that is to give the artist a preview mode and a detail mode. For instance, we could use what we had in the last lesson as our output for a preview mode and then get the result of our poly reduce node as our detail mode. And we can do that by getting a switch node and plugging in both of our results. Now we can basically switch between the two. And uh, what we're going to do later when we turn this graph into an HDA that we can use in Unreal, we're going to link up the switch node to a parameter in our UI so that the artist can paint in this uh, more responsive mode. And then once they're happy with uh, the result, they can go and then press a toggle and, uh, and enabling the detail mode. And in that way, instead of forcing them to wait every time, we turn this waiting into a conscious decision where the artist goes, okay, I'm, I'm happy now with this. I'm fine waiting a minute. I'm gonna, I don't know, get some water, get a coffee or whatever. And then I'm coming back and I have a finished model. All right, so that was it for this chapter. We've added some interesting detail and edge damage. In the next chapter, which is my favorite in the ruins tool, we're gonna add some nasty flesh bits uh, that connect all over the place. So if you're interested in that, uh, make sure to check out the next video and um, I hope to see you and have a good one. Bye-bye.